Good evening and thank you very much for joining us here on The Conversation, um, going live every Friday um, here on the Namibians Facebook page. Now this evening we'll be delving into the, the performance of our leadership here in Namibia um, in regards to the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we have two experts from different fields. We have the Executive Director of the IPPR, Graham Hopwood, as well as the former Health Minister and now the Chairperson, um, therefore, um, for, from the uh, African Public Health, if I'm not institution, if I'm not not incorrect, Dr. Bernard Halfika. We're going to delve into just the medical side of things. How far politics should be should be played um, into a pandemic when it comes to leadership decisions, and we're also just going to deal with uh, whether we've seen proper leadership from um, the president and his fellow ministers and those under them. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, uh, Graham, let's start with you. Um, let's just uh, reflect a bit from last year to, to where we are right now. Last year this time we were in a very, very stern and strict lockdown. Um, at first we started with Comas and Irongo regions or those two regions and then we moved on to um, the rest of the country. Whereas now we are, hit, we are in the third wave with um, uh, cases going as high as 2,000 per day, deaths going as high as 33, 34 per day, yet the lockdown is just in Comas Reboth, uh, in Ventuk Reboth and Okahanya. And it seems like life just goes on more in Ventuk, for instance, as usual. Just how can we um, make sense to what we're experiencing now? Well, I think if we take the 15-month trajectory of the oh, pandemic God. from, you know, from March last year, I would give I'm government person. fairly good marks for the way things started off. And um, obviously they did introduce important welfare initiatives and the lockdown was harsh and it was painful for the economy, but we did suppress the transmission levels for quite some time. So in a way we did what everybody was talking about in, in the world, which is flattening the curve and uh, buying ourselves time to prepare for a possibly uh, worse period and a more infectious wave. But what seems to have happened, particularly I think after the end of the state of emergency in September, is that you know, governments, but also other sectors of society got very complacent uh, and, and people in general became complacent. And clearly, um, you know, as we now realize from the problems in the hospitals, that we didn't use that time that we had bought by having a heavy lockdown to certainly deal with the issues in the health system. So we didn't deal with basic issues like making sure we had a, enough oxygen and it could be properly supplied to the hospitals. We don't seem to have, we have added beds, but we don't seem to have added enough ICU and maximum care beds. Um, so the, the main sort of um, theme of the, the period really is, the, uh, is one of complacency after, after a good start where government seemed to address some of the, some of the issues and, uh, and, and found them, uh, put them, gave themselves some space and time to, to uh, react properly in a policy way in, in terms of allocating resources to make sure that we had a health system that was, I can't really say fit for purpose because it wasn't really fit for purpose before, but actually in a position at least to do much better than we are doing now with this terrible third wave that we're in. Yeah. Um, Dr. Alfika, let's go to you. I just want to correct myself there. Um, he is the chairperson of the African Public Health Foundation now. Um, Dr. Alfiku, the time that we had, uh, the time that we bought ourselves um, between last year and this year, and we also somewhere had in the beginning of the year and late last year, we had, we had our second wave. Do you think we have truly done enough in terms of the health aspect to help us prepare for the third wave that we're currently facing now? Uh, doctor, oh, sorry, I, uh, think, uh, yeah. I think I was muted. Yeah, yeah, so if this was the best case scenario, one would say we have done above average. But given the current prevailing situation in the, current, in the country, then we have done 
absolute sub-average. And that is in preparation and planning for an, a long-term eventuality. I think people were thinking that COVID-19 was just a walk in the park. Uh, they will suppress it once, or, especially the fact that we have so many days with no community transmission of, of the virus. It was all cases coming in and out. So we locked the border and the flat, um, the cave was truly flat. And then people thought that that's it, we won't get it. Unfortunately, like Graham said, complacency set in, and then conspiracy theory came in. The virus was manufactured to depopulate us, and so on and so on. And then confusion set in. Even now, people are confused as to what to do now. Um, to take a vaccine or not to take it, to do what, and to take ivermectin or not to take it, to take hydroxychloroquine or to steam. So there's so much confusion up there. And it emanated from that, that sort of secondary uh, position that we have after the first wave and possibly part of the second wave. Then comes the infrastructure and commodities for better treatment and response to the uh, pandemic. Obviously, our infrastructure are, are not up to scratch. They're not enough to accommodate those that are infected, severely ill, and then you have things like oxygen running out of, uh, um, uh, you know, space. So preparation, behavior, complacency, just make our case worse. Yeah. Doctor, if we have to look into, because some people had said that uh, perhaps it's politics at play here, why we sort of had the complacency. If we look at a pandemic, how much can we allow politics to play? We should never allow politics in health. Um, it, it must be to the bare minimum of cabinet decision, parliamentary act, etc., uh, programming, uh, with the briefing of political heads, but on the day-to-day -day administration and management and planning of health, uh, there should be no policy because health is a non-partisan um, uh, entity. I mean, as a doctor, I cannot just treat my members of my political party. I have to treat even those that I don't agree with uh, politically. I mean, it's like in a war situation. We can fight a battle. If I'm a doctor there, I will treat the victims of my enemies uh, if they get injured. So there should be no politic in the pandemic, there should be no politic in health. It should be minimal to policy setting, that we're setting regulation and policy, not on day-to-day -day, um, operations. Yeah. Uh, you were earlier saying, Doctor, people were thinking it would be a walk in a park. What exactly, who are you referring to? Well, um, if you look at the two things um, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, there were proposals to prepare the whole country in a coordinated way with standard procedures and protocol in place. That opportunity was never granted by those who had the power to grant or to deny. Hmm. There was a case of this rhino garment factory here in Vindu. Yeah. And I really wish that I could have shared the pictures with you because I'm hearing now. Um, uh, oh. Of rhino garment factory not being. When it was indeed qualified, it was evaluated and qualified by the engineers and architects from the Ministry of Health. Yeah. And we went as far as getting a drawing, how the bettings, the toilets, the patient flow, all these pictures are with Alan. There is a chap at the Ministry of Health called Alan. Alan is the Ministry of Health architect, I mean architect. He drew up all these things. We were making rapid progress, actually, with Rhino Garment Factory. Now, when I hear it was found to be unsuitable, hmm. then I, I wonder, what was Alan doing? And he's the chief architect for the ministry and ministry of work. So in that regard, people thought it's not necessary to have a capacity up to 500 to 1,000 bed because rhino garment factory can accommodate up to 1,000 patients. Then we could put up 
two other hubs, maybe in the coast, at the coast, maybe in the north. And we needed to standardize right from the beginning, even if we were not going to get so many cases. We could uh, break down our systems and, and resemble if nothing worse comes up. But it's worse to be hit in the way that we are being hit now yeah. and ill-prepared. I'm not saying there's no preparation, but we are ill-prepared. Let's just accept that. Yeah. Um, uh, Graham, let's go to you. Um, we often hear from when Dr. Shangula um, responds to a question or, or addresses the nation, he always starts with, no one expected the pandemic to hit. Um, we are a year and four months into the pandemic, um, and we've seen global spikes in India of recent, in Brazil, South Africa next to us. We've also seen it in Tunisia and Zambia is now the third or the second worst hit African country currently. We've also seen it in the US, uh, all over in, in Europe. And um, can you perhaps reflect or, or, or help us just look at some of the examples we've seen of how Germany has closed down, of how South Africa has closed down, and, and, and um, just uh, sort of compare and contrast to here at home at, um, in terms of leadership of what we're seeing? Well, we, we should have expected a more infectious wave and we should have planned for it. And I think that that was clear all along. Um, and that's where we seem to have failed really badly. Um, but the, the other thing that we've done pretty badly is roll out the vaccines. Um, there's a huge vaccine hesitancy due to the issues that the doctor mentioned, uh, conspiracy theories and disinformation. But government hasn't been proactive enough to, to get people to go to the vaccines and uh, to get the vaccines. And that, that's why one of the reasons why the, the disease, uh, the virus is now spreading so quickly. So um, if you look at, you know, there are more developed countries, but countries like the UK, and even the US, um, where they have had m more than 50% of their target populations have been vaccinated. I mean, in the US, I, I don't think it's advisable, but they're walking around without any masks or any social distancing regulations at the moment. In, in the UK, you know, the bars are reopened, the businesses are reopening. F things aren't back to normal, but things are starting to function uh, in a much uh, more, much better way. And um, mm. This is the key, really, to recovery in Namibia. We knew this months ago that we had to get the vaccines going alongside the other policy responses. And, um, you know, we haven't got that happening. Admittedly, we're, again, we're up against a huge tide of disinformation, conspiracy theories, and people who are actively discouraging others from uh, following the, the health guidelines. In this case, you know, go and get vaccinated. Um, so, you know, the, the, there are examples around the world of where vaccination in particular has taken place this year, um, that uh, where they've managed to start to emerge from this pandemic crisis. But we're a long, long way from that, unfortunately. If we continue at the same, at the current vaccination rate, yeah. we'll only have vaccinated 60% of the population probably towards the end of 2023. And we can't actually wait that long. Yeah. When we look at the uh, number of people who are vaccinated, as you in indicated, we're now at almost 100,000. Um, and our vaccines, the number of vaccines we got were so far about 197,000. Um, we're still expecting some by the end of this month, uh, early next month. That is the sign of um, um w Would you say that we missed a, a sort of... Back in the day when we had uh, s smaller pandemics just hit the, the country or, or epidemics hit the country, we would always run a vaccination um, campaign. Do you think that that is missing? That everyone keeps on asking where exactly is the campaign that they usually do their full-on runs with? Absolutely. I mean, that, that, you know, the Ministry of Health has increases activity on this in the last few weeks. You see more graphics and more um, material on, uh, on, on social media. But um, there's so much more that could be done. I mean, I, I sit and wait for the news to start every night. And before the news, they show the same videos they were showing almost a year ago uh, of the same doctor who's talking about vaccines when they come and 
when, when they've um, come up with a vaccine, why aren't we producing messages that are, you know, now, for, for the situation now, why doesn't NBC help out and, and get lots of short inserts uh, uh, promoting the vaccines and explaining the situation and promoting the other aspects, the, the, the other health guidelines? So it's the complacency, I think, that set in. We just didn't plan and we didn't do these things. But some of these things could happen quickly, you know, and the other parts of society have to play a role. I can't lay it yeah. all on government. Yeah. I mean, business has not done enough. I only see old mutual and maybe a couple of finance houses putting out material and adverts. Where's the tourism industry? Their whole future depends on us emerging from this pandemic. Yeah. And yet I don't see them uh, getting involved in uh, promoting the health guidelines or promoting uh, vaccination programs. The churches are, are totally missing. Um, you know, I see a lot of the anti-vaxxer community are people who say, well, I'm leaving it all to God. It's not down to me. I'm not going to get vaccinated. Yeah. So they need leadership from their religious leaders, their church leaders. And I haven't really heard anybody significant, um, even uh, major church leaders have, have passed away from, from COVID. So um, traditional leaders, you know, so um, we're seeing now young influencers coming forward, I think particularly on Twitter and encouraging their cohorts to go and vaccinate, get vaccinated. And I think that's encouraging. But of course, we know the younger generation are not so much at risk. It's the more middle-aged and older people who seem to be stuck in a lot of a sort of quagmire of disinformation and they don't know how to emerge from it. And uh, we have to have much better proactive um, health campaigns to, and pro-vaccination campaigns to, to really change this around and quite quickly. Yeah. Um, I, I must come in there, Graham. I've seen um, the tourism industry sort of so here and there. They're sort of putting out posters and putting out little messages. Um, with the churches, we, uh, with the churches, it's quite interesting. When we saw the spike in deaths, um, or before, let me, let me go, let me go a bit back. Before we saw the spike in deaths, the ministry had an engagement with the church leaders. That was a very interesting one, where religious um, doctors, or oh, sorry, religious uh, uh, leaders stood up and told the ministry um, that they will not get vaccinated and their church will not get vaccinated at all. And then we saw a turn a few days ago, let's say about a week ago, we saw um, a church leader, in fact, put out a video encouraging his, his congregation to get um, vaccinated. So, um, but it's only been one or two. We haven't really seen an overall, as you say, they are truly missing in this. Um, but Dr. Alfiku, we've heard from some doctors who spoke to us um, who said that the regulations from government um, is a little too late. Um, do you share the same thoughts? No, I don't think this. Uh, well, first of all, uh, maybe we needed someone from either government, uh, from Attorney General's Office or Ministry of Justice or Ministry of Health to, to be able to articulate that point. I, I would possibly not be the best one to, yeah. uh, to do that. Uh, I don't think there's anything with the regulation. I mean, I read all of them, the latest one. Mm. The, the, but they are regulation on papers. The problem is our behaviors as society mm. doesn't, you know, doesn't connect to those regulations. I don't know whether it's the, people, uh, the public nature or is it a kind of lack of trust and confidence in the regulation or those who make it. I don't know. That's why we need all of it, not just on the number of cases that we picking up. We need to understand why are the po why the population why why is society not connecting? Why does society seems to be defying the regulations? We need to understand that. We need to understand data. Mm. Why are certain cases or certain regions are picking up very very extremely few cases and other regions so much? So we need to understand that, and it, it needs to be guided by data. And those data need to be shared and be co-owned. It could just not be the property of one sector. And we truly needed to approach this multi-sectoral. You're talking about the religious group. I mean, I have addressed a, quite a number of religious institutions when I was in COVID response. And they're quite happy. And I think that sort of interaction, not just telling them what you are doing as, as an authority, but listening to them to understand they are concerned. The same with traditional leaders, private business, etc. We must 
find out are the people disillusioned? Do they feel alienated with uh, policy making and regulation? Or what exactly is leading to what we are experiencing now? Yeah. Um, Graham, you, you spoke of also just saying it shouldn't be all on government. Um, and, and government has said that, you know what, we can't handle this on the, our own. We need more from other sectors. What exactly, except for the vaccination, what else could private sector do? What else could private sector do to, to help with um, just lightening the burden from, from government? Well, I saw a leading businessman on Facebook today say, you know, how on earth did we get into this situation? Because e even if government has problems, as a society and as a business community, we should have been there and, and sorted this out. So, for example, the oxygen I issues. I mean, the, the problem is partly the nature of the supply from private suppliers. But clearly, the, the issues there haven't been addressed. And um, if it's a money issue and resources for the extra um, wards, whether they're at Ramatex or whether they're somewhere else, it has reached the point of such gravity now that we, the private sector does need to step in and assist government uh, with funds, but also with practical ideas that, that any companies that are involved in oxygen production, they should come together and, and assist government. Uh, I think government's got a lot to answer for here, but there's, there's ways that we can move quickly maybe to get the situation corrected and, and i'm saying this because you know i have a friend in in hospital at the moment who is basically struggling to survive not because covid is killing him but because he can't get the oxygen um, that is necessary and we can't allow this to go on a day longer the government the president and dr shangula should have announced an immediate plan to deal with all these issues to bring in the necessary stakeholders to get it sorted and if they really can't do it, then we have international development partners. Get them involved. You know, they are the ones who are, in, you know, supposedly um, helping us with, with vaccines. They can do a lot more. And, um, you know, so th there's no time to waste now. People are dying every day. And, and we see that. And everybody's affected now. I mean, I think everybody knows somebody who's passed away or more people or have, have their relatives and friends in, in hospital, or in my case, also friends who are sick at home because they can't get into a hospital. So, you know, this is something that requires, you know, no more talk and, and an immediate action uh, on, on the part of governments, but bringing in the stakeholders. And I think we do need a national alliance to be set up immediately to, to, to tackle this, where everybody commits, um, because uh, as the doctor said, it's not a political issue anymore. You can't get party politics involved in this. We've got to all come together and solve it and work on attacking this immediately. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Fiku, the oxygen issue. So um, I wanted to ask you, you were in the position that Dr. Shangula was in. You, ha you were privy to information when it came to the oxygen um, supply at the time that you were the minister was the oxygen supply to hospitals before the pandemic before everything was it um, considered up to standard was it considered enough for the hospitals at the time when i was in the ministry there were two issues that came up regarding oxygen supply to public hospital one is the fact that the the supplier or the company that generates oxygen on site for the public health facility was generating and pumping oxygen into the pipes to the places in the hospital where it is required. They were not filling cylinders. That is one problem that was identified. Uh, it can be contested, but that is one problem we identified. The second problem was the purity of the oxygen issue. They, they were a team of, from Geneva, from the World Health Organization, that set standard for oxygen. And they found that our oxygen supply by the time was below what is um, recommended. Perhaps not that great, because I mean, people could have been dying, but there was no mass uh, death as a result of that. Those were the two issues. For me, um, the issue of not filling cylinder was very serious in terms of reserve and also economically because the ministry was buying cylinders while it has a contract 
for on-site oxygen generation. Those were two, the two issues, and uh, I can confirm that they were there up to 2018. Uh, if they are resolved, and this is one of the gap now we have in the discussion that we don't have someone from the Ministry of Health, uh, mm -hmm. they could clarify what is the current situation with oxygen. But linking oxygen to the pandemic, these are all things that we should have prepared. Oxygen, um, isolation on a larger scale, human resources, as a country, as a, as a multi-sectoral approach, all in sectors included, not just the Ministry of Health. In fact, my own opinion is that COVID response should never be inserted in the normal structure of the Ministry of Health. It shouldn't, because it just crowds out other services. Many people are now suffering because they don't have bed. The ward that was supposed to be cashed yesterday, or the day before yesterday, a classmate of mine died between Vinduk and Okahanja because he was kept at a room with uh, oxygen privately, which we don't know how far to what extent. He could not get oxygen at Okahanja, Okahanja casualty. The isolation room at Okahanja are full. He could not be accommodated anyway. And as we speak, I have patients that are sent to the respiratory unit at Katutura because none of the private hospitals had any bed and therefore no oxygen for another one extra uh, patient. Mm. These are the realities that we need to deal with now, not in talk, but in action, and not as Ministry of Health or someone else, but as a country. All of us need to come together. But we need to question the, 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 the issue that Graham raised the, of the private sector. Yes. Before we plead with them to come on board, we need to understand why are they not on board? Mm -hmm. They must tell us. Maybe they have an issue in terms of leadership or so. We cannot just say come on the board. They must tell us what are their concerns and then we resolve that. Yeah. Um, let's speak about the private hospitals, for instance. Um, we have uh, sources telling us that the private hospitals, for instance, did not want to invest in more facilities, firstly, because um, after COVID, they don't see it as profitable for them, one, two. They've also indicated, so they were part of the Rhino Garment Factory um, conversion, for instance. They were part of it, but they pulled out later because they said they don't have the financial um, um, financial backing to invest into the, the the factory if we look at those two decisions from the private hospitals firstly can one hold them accountable for their decisions and to, to, to not include themselves or not to increase the bed capacity and just now shift it to to public sector and and, and secondly um in, if we look around the world, what role has, uh, has private hospitals played um, in, in assisting government when it comes to the pandemic? Doctor. Um, I was invited to the group of private hospitals by Professor Lichtman, uh, who is a well-known professor at ICU at Phoenix Central Hospital. And in the first meeting I had with them, I asked them because they were setting up rooms and beds, Rhino Park, maybe eight or six, Medi Clinic, four or five, Lady Pahamba, et cetera, Catholic Hospital. Then I asked them the question, and this I quote myself, do one of facility? And when COVID comes, all of you will have a share in your hospital of COVID that will possibly even pass on to the other patient and take up the space for other patients? Or would you rather come together with government and put up one facility for Bindu and you can put up another one somewhere else? And they all say, it's a brilliant idea. Let's go for that. Now, the fund will never be enough. Everybody's complaining that we don't have money. But when we have the will to work together, and if you look at the spending now we did on quarantine, on isolation, yes. on testing of people that are conduct and not showing any symptom, doing the most expensive PCR. We spent money uneconomically. That's my assertion. We could have spent it better. And we had the private sector. I had a meeting with all the retail shops 
from all the names you can name, retail, supermarket, and they were willing to commit money. But they had a condition which I would not cite here because it may become personal. They had a condition that if we manage this issue that we identified, we will move money into the program. So that's why I said before we invite the private sector to the table, we must also understand their issue. We must understand their issue, why are they not on the table? Because they may be valid issues. So those are the, the issues that I wanted to highlight. Yeah. Um, we have two questions from our viewers. We have from Jeanette uh, Schmidt. She said, Doctor, why didn't you include more nurses in the response team? Um, how many nurses were involved in the planning of the facilities? Um, I guess it's during the time that you were there. Um, obviously, now you, you cannot speak on that. And the second question is, um, what do you think uh, um, of the fact that, the, that you were removed from the COVID response team? Or do you think it was a political move rather than what is best for the country? And uh, speaking out against um, incompetence in the betterment of public health um, deserve repercussions. Uh, I, I, on the question of my removal, you know, it puzzled me up to now to the extent that I don't, uh, I don't think to that. I think the president and Dr. Shambula will better respond to that. I, I can only repeat the letter that I have read to the meeting written by Dr. Shambula from, uh, to remove me from the program. Uh, but I actually never condemned the lie that was condemned in that, in that letter that I have divulged publicly confidential information and harassed uh, staff at the COVID center. Those are the two things I never condemned them before. But I can tell you now that they were lie, honestly speaking. They were lies because you can go to the COVID center there and talk to the staff who, who are there. When I joined the COVID center, there were not even toilet papers for the staff. I bought them. They were not even getting a tea. I bought them literally um, uh, cho hot chocolate and bat and all the out of my own money, which I never said. Now, for the lie that was in the paper, I don't know. Dr. Sambula must be able to explain that. I, I don't want to go to that one. And yeah. I have never said it actually, but that is a lie. And I, I had all the respect for senior people, but that, that was the lies of the highest order. I never harassed anyone. I pushed for results. That much I do, even when I was at the meeting. If we agree to do something, we have to do it and get the result, but no harassment, etc. So, I mean, I, I defer that question to Dr. Sangula, maybe, to, to answer you and the president. Yeah, yeah. Um, Graham, back to you. Um, um, in the beginning, you, you were scoring government just on, you know, how they were doing in the beginning now. Um, do you think that the measures are strict enough? I know you're not a, a health expert, but just from what you've observed, um, and, and, and how much can we um, um, sort of, not sort of blame, but hold account the public for, 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 for how complacent they've gotten in, in, in the last year? Well, I mean, yes, yeah, as, as I said, everybody's become complacent and... and um you know, people do bear responsibility when they don't uh, follow the, the basic health, gui health guidelines. I still meet people who, uh, you know, before anti-vaxxers, there were anti-maskers who, who refused to, to wear masks and things like that. So, and of course, the gatherings got out of control, as video evidence has shown, uh, and, and were simply breaking, you know, all the regulations and the laws on, on that. So, um, you know, I think uh, the, the we, we learned last year that any prolonged lockdown will just kill the economy completely. So government had that difficult task of trying to balance measures against allowing the economy at least to breathe in some way. I think the current uh, measures are mostly sensible. They could have perhaps been introduced a bit, bit earlier, but um, we have to review them again in early July. So, you know, there's the, 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 they're not perhaps the main issue at the moment. I think... The, one of the biggest issues, apart from the crisis at the hospitals, is the, is the huge tide of disinformation that's uh, you know, swamping Namibia at the moment and is deterring people from, from going for the vaccinations and just to make sure that the vaccination process itself is, 
efficient. Um, you mentioned, you know, um, uh, uh, do we have in place plans for further deliveries, whether under COVAX or other um, sources of vaccines? And although I understand government has to negotiate often co on commercial terms to get these vaccines, it would be nice to have a bit more reassurance of what was coming, particularly if, as we hope, the vaccine take up will pick up and it does seem to be picking up. I mean, the queues are getting long now and I think possibly government needs to look at how it can make that process more efficient, but also to have the confidence that we have a pipeline of vaccine, vaccine deliveries so that we know that we won't run out in, in, a, in a month or six weeks. Yeah, um, uh, Graham. Also, um, let's look at you know. Um, some people have said that they 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 don't have faith in in a, in their health minister, and and perhaps uh, Dr. Alfika can also um, touch on this. But Graham, perhaps, what do you think when when we're in a health crisis, people don't trust their their health minister. Um, a lot of people have said that they, on our, right now, on our social media and across our stories, you know, they, they've said that they have mis they don't trust Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Shangula at all. What are your thoughts to that? Um, what does it say about public trust? Uh, I don't know about that, really. I, I think Dr. Shangula's, you know, in terms of providing a sort of calm approach to this and providing regular information um, and, and keeping us updated with at least basic statistics and data. Um, the, the ministry and himself have done a reasonable job. Um, and I appreciate that, that he's uh, constantly available. He's on TV often and uh, um, he's there constantly releasing these daily updates and, and other information bulletins. But uh, what, what maybe it's not in his personality really to be that kind of dynamic champion that we now need for the vaccine program. So I wouldn't blame him, but as um, Dr. Hafiku said, this is probably not just the health ministry's issue. The, the, the whole of government and obviously the Ministry of Information in particular needs to be doing the communication side of it and, and really mm. pushing that because that, that's sort of gone missing. We've done the basic releasing a, you know, a press statement every day, giving us the basic figures, but the, 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 the more um, proactive element is missing. And I think a Ministry of ICT, together with the media and other partners, could have been really active and can still be really active in, in, in countering the disinformation and promoting the vaccine program. Yeah. Um, Dr. Afiku, um, I, I know I said this conversation is about the health aspect or the leadership aspect during this pandemic, but a lot of our, our um, viewers have a few questions when it comes to the medical side. For instance, what do you think of the use of the drug of ivermectin? which is not, the council has today once again put out another statement warning um, those uh, who are um, distributing that specific drug. And we also have the Medical Association of Namibia also warning um, doctors and nurses or any pharmacist from distributing this to humans. So um, the viewer specifically asked, what do you think of the use of that? The, the problem we have with ivermectin is enough data to power a uh, population rollout, even in the case of pandemic. That's why I think the WHO statement that says ivermectin is recommended to use under controlled trials and cohorts only, meaning that as, as a sort of a trial where you see more outcome rather than what has happened so far. And much of the study um, that have happened on ivermectin are actually retrospective study, not prospective uh, randomized control. And that is where we should be. I know that community um, and people are very desperate. And when people are desperate, there's little you can tell them not to do um, when they really want to survive. That much I understand. But I think it's still prudent for us to stick to the basic and to, to stick to science in the end. It's actually science that will take us out of the pandemic. Simple public health measures, vaccine, as we discussed, but even vaccine with all the reports. Because, I mean, today I had people calling me uh, saying that their friends and family who were vaccinated are now... ...as conspiracy. We need to look at it, thoroughly investigate these cases, and found out if there's anything 
or any way that some people are reacting to things such as vaccine. Mm -hmm. we, we cannot just hammer our own signs into people's mind. We need to be sensitive to that. But ivermectin, I think the statement of saying it should be used only under controlled trial, I think it's a fair statement and we need to stick to that. But if somebody there on the farm uh, is using ivermectin, we have absolutely no control over that. And if a farmer uses it and he got better, he's likely to give it to his workers or another farmer next door to it. And we are not there. So under those conditions, if we get enough um, um, demand to do a cohort, and I have asked a colleague two months ago whether we have a, cohort, a clinical cohort on avimectin. It's absolutely important that we have even locally generated data to be able to determine in a more definite way whether avimectin works or it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, uh, doctor, let's just go also a bit back to what we've seen in terms of um, from the nurses and doctors. Um, for instance, now, like I just mentioned, there is a, a doctor firstly and a pharmacist distributing ivermectin one. Two, we've seen um, doctors and nurses sort of not have trust in the vaccine itself, whereas people would go to them for advice and say, do you think I should take the vaccine? And th they just sort of saying no. And we, we've heard nurses, um, for instance, when I went to go get vaccinated, some of the nurses also said they're not getting vaccinated despite, you know, giving the vaccine to um, vaccinating other people. Um, how does... Um, if we look at doctors and nurses that are supposed to be our, you know, our direction or, or our guide in terms of vaccines, and, and they are hesitant, do we can we really blame the public for being hesitant as well if the doctors and nurses themselves are the ones saying that they don't have trust the vaccine? Well, that's what I say. It's a matter of being sensitive and understand. Um, the question of whether you are vaccinated or not, you know, doesn't really it's your conscience and your duty to seek understanding and information about whatever product you want to take, even a vaccine. I mean, it's the same with the HIV. I've been tested for HIV. I, I mean, I even did the public testing in, at one of the conferences. But then people say, no, 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 he just put a syringe here. It's not true test. When people say, even the president of the United States, and the president of Russia and China, the world power, have been vaccinated. They say, no, they just put some water in the syringe and inject them. That is the level of mistrust that we are dealing with. And we need to go out there audaciously uh, to dismantle that. And we can only dismantle this level of conspiracy and misinformation if we involve the community themselves at the community level and family level. That, that, is, that is actually the way. So yeah. it's, no, it's no use to say if the nurses, for instance, in Otapi Hospital about a month ago, hardly anyone has taken it. And then people phone my, me every day, Dr. Afiku, have you been vaccinated? I say, what does it help whether I'm vaccinated or not? You have to make an individual well-informed choice and decision that I want to be vaccinated or I don't want to be vaccinated. If you don't want to be vaccinated, you take the full responsibility of any consequence as well. That is what is supposed to be. Um, Dr. Fico, have you been vaccinated? Well, this is just what I explained to you here, <laughs> and I'm not going to answer that because it's no point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I definitely <laughs> understand that. Yeah. Um, Graham, have we been yeah. seeing the NGOs also assisting a government in sort of helping them with the vaccination? Um, a campaign? Have we seen NGOs step in and assist also where, where help is needed? No, I think that's been disappointing. We do have a number of health NGOs um, that were set up, you know, during the worst period of uh, HIV AIDS. And I'm a little bit surprised that they haven't played any kind of public role or um, uh, uh, I'm not aware of them offering specific assistance um, you know, we at IPPR have been running our Namibia fact check to counter disinformation, and we are trying to ramp that up as much as we can um, to basically uh, counter the conspiracy theories and uh, to promote the vaccinations. Um, but uh, otherwise, I don't see, I don't think, I think civil society is one of those other sectors which hasn't 
which probably was complacent and hasn't played a full enough role in this. So um, there's so much more that we can all do. Yeah, yeah. Um, unfortunately, we have run out of time. Um, so I'm going to pose a last question and you can just add your, your, your closing or, or your last words in there. Um, Dr. Alfiku, um, what would you advise? Everyone is in a panic right now. Everyone is sort of in a, a phase and, and they don't know what exactly is happening or feeling that they don't have a grip right now on what they need to do. What is your advice to everyone out right now in Namibia, sort of just fearing for the next minute, the next day, the next statistic coming out? Well, I think, first of all, we must put the politics aside. We must uh, uh, look forward for, for the sake of saving the nation. We must do what is practical, and I have already suggested, actually, to your colleague, that for now, we must, as a matter of agency and as a country, address the issue of oxygen and bed space. That is one thing. We must continue with health measures. Please. Oh, it seems that, like, yeah, okay. So the public, that we bring something, not just the Ministry of Health, government and private sector together. Let's come together even tomorrow on a Saturday and say, guys, as a country, this is what we're planning, not just the Ministry of Health. Let's look at a sufficient place where we can admit patients that can be treated by both state and private. Let's get country or generated work together with the development partners, with the communities, with religious and workers, everyone must come on board so that everyone else is taking the message up there. But the time for talk and accusation should be over by now. And only then can we pass through the wave. That's my remark. Yeah. Um, Graham, what is your message to perhaps the public sector and NGOs in this time? Well, I think um, at some point there'll have to be an inquest into what has gone wrong and how we got to this point. but. That's not the issue now, really. The issue, as, as Dr. Hafiku said, is how do we come together quickly and effectively uh, as a nation um, with the government to, to deal with the immediate issues at the hospitals, to deal with the broader issues of why this is spreading and to promote the vaccination program. So um, NGOs have to play an active role and need to speak up on this alongside all the other sectors of society. Um, so. Uh, while we might have indulged a little bit in a blame game tonight, that isn't really the issue. Mm. The, the, you know, we can all have hindsight on what should have happened a year ago or t six months yeah. ago. But the key issue now is to get together, as the doctor said, and, and let's tackle these urgent issues which are costing lives probably, you know, every day and every hour. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining me. Um, that brings us to the end of the conversation. And, and as both of our panelists have said, is that everyone should come together at this time. We have over 11,000 active cases, um, and, and, and that includes the hospitalized cases. So keep safe. Um, adhere, please adhere to the COVID-19 regulations. And... Um, it should be an individual decision, but get the jab. Um, from me, Shilligan Peterson, it was an absolute pleasure. Um, good evening.